Hi, welcome back everyone for another lecture in the Sequoia Park Zoo's Conservation Lecture Series. Uh, thanks for joining us on Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. I'm Dr. Ruth Mock and I'm the Director of Conservation and Research at the Sequoia Park Zoo. I co-chair the Zoo's Conservation Advisory Committee, which oversees the Zoo's conservation programs that were highlighted in our previous slideshow, including this lecture series. This year's virtual conservation lecture series is sponsored by our friends over at Papa and Barkley. So thanks so much, Papa and Barkley. We hope you'll join us for the entire series, which runs through March on the third Wednesday of each month. Um, this lecture will run in the same format as the previous lectures, but I wanna share just a few technical reminders before we start. As a disclaimer, this lecture is being recorded and it's streaming live on Facebook. If we have any technical issues, I'm going to request help from Ashley with the Sequoia Park Zoo Foundation, who is working in the background to facilitate this talk like usual. So thank you, Ashley. And if for any reason your connection to Zoom is dropped and you're unable to reconnect, you can also watch and comment live on Facebook. And if you're having any trouble connecting to Zoom, you might not be logged into your account and we do require that our participants be logged into those free Zoom accounts before clicking the link to the lecture. So you can give that a try if you're having any, any issues. And you'll notice that we have our participants' um, cameras turned off and the audio muted automatically. And we would appreciate it if everyone would remain muted and with their videos off so that we can provide the best streaming experience for everyone. And then down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a chat button. And you can ask questions to the speaker by clicking on that button, which is gonna pop up a chat box. And that's where you can type your question. So we will try to answer everyone's questions at the end of the lecture. And we're also gonna monitor the Facebook Live comments. So we'll answer questions from there as well. And you can just feel free to submit your questions as you come up with them during the talk and we'll address them over at the end. Um, and then finally, during our in-person lectures, we always pass the hat around to collect donations for the zoo's conservation fund, because we really want to continue to support conservation work across the globe, and that's how we do it. So this year, we're virtually passing the hat, um, so we're going to be sharing a link to donate in that chat area that we already described. So for those on Facebook, if you would like to donate, you can do that on our website which is www.sequoiaparkzoo.net. And we really wanna thank our community for prioritizing conservation because all of these programs would not be possible without you all. All right, and now I am thrilled to introduce environmental journalist, Ben Goldfarb. Thanks, Ben. Um, ben is the author of this fantastic book called Eager, The Surprising Secret Lives of Beavers and Why They Matter. And he's the winner of the 2019 Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Award. And his work has um, appeared in many highly regarded journals and the Washington Post. So you can check him out there. He's very prolific. And if you haven't had a chance to read his book, we will include a link in the chat for purchasing the book. I loved it. I'm a huge beaver believer. And we're excited to have Ben here tonight to discuss why these animals are absolutely essential to our ecosystems and how they can help us mitigate the impacts of climate change. So thanks for joining us, Ben, and for sharing your expertise. We are turning the spotlight over to you now. Okay, thanks so much for having me. Let me share my screen here. How does that, how does that look? That looks great, Ben. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for being here tonight. I'm, I'm really excited to be uh, joining you. I, I live in Spokane, Washington, um, but Humboldt County is a place that I'd, I'd rather be right now, I think. I'm sure you, you've got, uh, yeah, you're having pr probably a, a better winter than, than we are. Um, so tonight I'll be talking about uh, beavers, of course, about how we can embrace and work with these animals uh, to address many of our, our pressing ecological crises from drought to water quality, to the extinction crisis, to climate change. Uh, but before I talk about using beavers as a, a tool, uh, I think it's important that we establish some kind of background facts uh, about what a beaver is and, and how they make their living. Uh, you know, I think that in the, in the kind of the beaver 
based restoration world. You know, we often talk about beavers as an instrument, uh, but it is important to take a minute to appreciate them as the kind of ecological or, or evolutionary uh, marvels that they are because they're, they're truly remarkable animals. Um, so of course, beavers are rodents. Uh, they're North America's largest rodent. A, a full-grown beaver is, you know, 50, 55 pounds at times. Uh, so I think they're, you know, heftier animals uh, than most people think they are. Uh, and of course, they're semi-aquatic rodents, which means they spend uh, pretty much all of their lives in and around water. Uh, and they've got all kinds of fantastic adaptations for this really unique semi-aquatic life they lead. Um, first, they've got uh, remarkably dense fur, Right? They're living in cold water. They need, they need to stay warm. Uh, they've got one of, the, one of the densest pelts in the animal kingdom. Uh, beavers have as many individual hairs on a postage stamp size patch of skin uh, as we have on our entire heads. So remarkably dense fur. Uh, they've got these wonderful webbed duck-like hind feet. They're very powerful, agile swimmers. They can uh, stay underwater for up to 15 minutes. So they're really, really champion breath holders. Uh, they've got a second set of eyelids uh, called nictitating membranes that basically act as goggles underwater, a set of translucent eyelids, uh, as well as a second set of lips, uh, kind of a, a pair of fur-lined valve-like lips behind their front teeth so they can chew and drag branches underwater without drowning. I think that's a really amazing adaptation, maybe my favorite uh, beaver adaptation. Uh, and then, of course, what's the beaver's most recognizable feature. What makes a, a beaver obviously a beaver? The tail, right? The tail is a really remarkable kind of multi-purpose uh, appendage. It's a fat storage device, so beavers actually put on fat for the winter in their tails. Uh, it's a, a kickstand when they're, when they're out on land. It's a rudder while they're swimming. Uh, and of course, it's an alarm system, right? I'm sure that uh, many of you who have been beaver country have heard the, the whack uh, of a beaver's tail striking the water and that's how they warn other beavers uh, about the presence of predators. So if you hear that sound, you're probably the predator, uh, at least in the beaver's mind, of course. And the other remarkable beaver feature uh, is their teeth. Uh, beavers have these wonderful kind of chisel-like incisors. You can sort of see this picture, the, the top and bottom uh, sets of incisors basically file each other down into these, these really nice sharp chisel-like points. Uh, and the teeth are orange, as you can see in that picture as well. And the reason for that is that beavers' teeth are actually sort of chemically and structurally fortified with iron, uh, which beavers derive from their food. And having these really iron-rich, powerful, durable teeth, of course, is important when you spend your whole life uh, cutting down trees. Right? Beavers, of course, are uh, totally herbivorous. As most of you probably know, they don't eat fish at all. Uh, they, they eat largely the cambium or the inner bark uh, of trees. Uh, you know, out west, their preferred species are willow, cottonwood, uh, aspen is you know, sort of their favorite food when they can, when they can find it. But they'll eat pretty much any uh, deciduous tree. Uh, they do tend to avoid conifers. And they also eat lots of sort of green herbaceous vegetation as well. You know, water lilies, cattails. Uh, I've seen them basically mow people's lawns for them. Um, so they're really, they're what scientists call choosy generalists. Uh, you know, they've got a few species of, of tree and plant that they prefer, but they'll eat just about just about anything. Again, with the, with the general exception of, of, uh, of cottonwoods, or of conifers rather. They love cottonwoods. So of course, in, in addition to, uh, to eating the cambium off of the trees that they fell, they also use the wood as construction material, uh, as this, this guy is doing here. And uh, beavers build two basic types of structures, uh, which many of you have probably seen. Uh, the first is the lodge. That's kind of the fundamental beaver housing unit. Uh, you can sort of see in this picture, this is, this is a, a pond in Colorado, um, you can sort of see that there are, you know, there, there are underwater tunnels uh, that lead up and into the lodge, and inside the lodge there's kind of an elevated nesting platform, essentially, where beavers, where the beavers raise their young. Uh, and in the lodge you've got, you know, two to as many as 
eight or so beavers. And that's the, the male and female, the mating pair who are generally monogamous, uh, the newborn beavers, the, the kits, the baby beavers, the one-year-olds and the two-year-olds. So you've got three year classes of offspring all cohabitating in the lodge together. Uh, so they're very cooperative kind of family oriented animals. And then during their second year, those two-year-old beavers, beavers will disperse out uh, looking for their own territories, like you know, teenagers heading off for, for college. So that's the lodge. Uh, and then of course the other uh, famous beaver structure is the dam. So why do beavers build dams? What is the point of this really unique, specialized kind of bizarre behavior that has no real analog in the animal kingdom? What are they doing there? Well, a beaver on land uh, is, as one biologist put it to me, a fat, slow, smelly package of meat, right? Beavers get eaten by cougars, bears, wolves, coyotes, you know, any kind of large carnivore is, is gonna be very happy to devour a beaver. So by building that dam and creating a nice, broad, deep pool, beavers are basically expanding their shelter, right? They're, again, they're, they're poor sort of walkers, but they're great swimmers. Uh, so you, know, you build that huge pond, and instead of having to walk over land uh, to that good looking aspen tree and maybe get eaten by a cougar along the way, you can swim to it instead, cut it down and then float it back uh, to your food cache and be relatively safe in the process. Uh, so beavers, by building that dam, creating that pond, they're really expanding the extent uh, of their own, their own shelter. Uh, and here's, uh, here's what happens to a beaver that spends too much time on land. This is a, 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 a beaver mandible and lower incisors that uh, I found in, in Minnesota. Um, and wolves actually eat the entirety of the beaver, um, the, you know, pelt, bones and all. And this is all that's left behind when a wolf gets through with a beaver. So you definitely, you don't want to be a beaver on land uh, is the, the takeaway there. So a typical beaver colony or a family unit is building oftentimes numerous dams at a single site. Uh, you know, there's, there's often kind of one big primary dam and a number of smaller secondary dams. You know, you see in some, in some places 15 or 20 dams built by a single colony. Uh, and these dams come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. Uh, you know, here's a nice little one in Montana that's probably, you know, a foot, a foot tall and three feet wide. You could, you know, jump across in a single stride. Uh, but they do get quite a bit bigger. Um, here's a, a nice one in, in Voyagers National Park uh, that's probably 14 or 15 feet tall and several hundred feet long and is no doubt the, uh, the work of many generations of beavers all adding their, their stick uh, to that, that really impressive structure. So the dams really can be quite, quite massive. Um, and, and you know, as a result, the, the impoundments that the beaver that beavers create are also enormous. Um, you know, here's here's a, a pond formed by a single, very strategically placed beaver dam at kind of the mouth of a of a canyon. So beavers, you know, they're, they're I often I often visit a, a stream and think, man, you know, if if, if a an engineer from the U.S. Army Corps had to build a dam that minimized labor and maximized the sound of the impoundment, they would put the dam exactly where the beavers did. Uh, they're really, you know, sort of hydrologically smart strategic builders. So this is, again, this is the work of a single dam that's impounding hundreds of acres uh, across a, a really vast area. And then the other beaver behavior or activity that, that's, that's really important to the whole kind of complex they create is their canal digging. You know, we talk about beavers as builders, of course, but they're also really good diggers. And they excavate these canal networks that can be hundreds of, of feet long and extend deep into the, the surrounding forest. And again, the point of that is, you know, instead of having to walk overland and get eaten, they can swim up those canals instead uh, and, and access their, their food source. So you often see at beaver sites these really amazing canal networks. That's a really important part of what they do. So here's what the whole sort of complex looks like when you put it together. This is um, a site in Colorado uh, that I visited a few years ago. Uh, this is at about 12,000 feet of elevation, so they really get way up there. Uh, and you know, and here you can sort of see that you know all of these kind of linear features here in this valley uh, are are beaver dams. You know, here's a nice here's a nice long one, um, and you can sort of see the canals that extend. Uh, off of that, those, those dams. Um, so, you know, if it weren't for the beavers, 
this stream would just be a kind of a straight string running right through that valley. But thanks to the beavers, there's just a huge amount of water storage uh, hanging out in the bottom of this, this little valley here. They've really created, created quite the elaborate uh, pond and, and wetland compound there. So of course, you know, beavers by building these dams and creating these ponds, you know, they're, they're, the point is to maximize their own food and shelter. But in the process, they're creating food and shelter for all kinds of other species as well, right? We know that uh, here in the American West, uh, wetlands are about 2% of, of total land area, but support 80% of biodiversity. So any animal that's capable of creating and expanding wetlands starts to look really important, right? Beavers are what scientists call a keystone species. Uh, so in architecture, you know, the keystone is the top block in a stone arch. And if you pull that block, the whole arch crumbles. Uh, so you know, that, that block is supporting a lot of, a lot of weight uh, in, the, in that structure. And likewise, you know, beavers are, are, are disproportionately important in, in aquatic ecosystems. They're really supporting uh, a lot of ecological weight. Uh, so you know, practically any, any creature you can name uh, you know, does pretty well in and around beaver complexes. Uh, a few examples, here's a, a great blue heron rookery um, that uh, I visited at a, a beaver pond in Wisconsin. So, you know, wading birds, waterfowls, even songbirds uh, do, do really well um, in and around beaver created habitats. Uh, moose, of course, and other, other kind of semi-aquatic mammals, uh, mink, muskrats, otters, uh, you know, it's kind of the vast community of aquatic mammals does all, all fares great around, around beavers. Uh, here's a cool example, I think. This is, so this is a, a beaver lodge, uh, also in Minnesota. Uh, and what happened here, you can sort of see, here's the, the, the beaver dam way down here, this straight line on the horizon. Uh, and for a long time, you know, that, that beaver dam basically had this whole meadow underwater. This was just a big beaver pond. And then the dam breached, the beavers moved on for whatever reason, uh, the pond drained, and this lodge was left behind. And uh, a pack of wolves actually moved into this area and raised their pups inside that lodge. Uh, so that's, a, that's beavers creating habitat for their direct predator. I think that's really, really amazing. I, I love that. Uh, and then another really important one that's, you know, that's crucial both in, uh, in Washington State, where I live, and in Northern California, where all of you are, uh, of course, is that beavers are creating really good habitat for anadromous fish, right, for salmonids. Uh, this is a, a, a juvenile steelhead. Um, and, you know, look, if you think about it, if you're, if you're, you know, a baby fish that's just a few inches long, you know, you don't want to live in the main stem of the river. You're just going to get blown downstream. What you want is a nice slow pool or a, a side channel or a backwater or an eddy. You want that complex slow water refuge habitat uh, that beavers create so well. So there's all kinds of studies showing that you know, juvenile trout and salmon production just explodes uh, in, in beaver complexes. Of course, kind of the, the common objection that you hear from, from anglers and even occasionally fish biologists is, you know, wait a second, we're trying to take dams out of rivers right now, right? Why would you want to put more obstacles in a stream that uh, a migrating salmon would have to, to cross? And, you know, to that I say, I mean, look, obviously beaver built dams and human built dams have nothing in common, right? Beavers uh, or, or fish rather can, you know, they can jump over uh, beaver dams. They can actually swim through the kind of the cracks in the woody structures. Uh, you know, they're often migrating at times of high flow when water is going up or around the, the, uh, the dams. You know, there, there's all kinds of studies showing that fish have no problem crossing beaver dams. Uh, here's a nice picture. I think this is a stream outside of Seattle uh, and here you can see the beaver dam, and here's a pool above the dam, uh, and you can see here two freshly dug coho salmon reds or nests. So obviously, in this case, uh, you know at least two salmon had no problem at all getting past this this measly beaver dam. And in fact, you know the evolutionary connection between beavers and fish is so deep, right? I mean, these are two animals that really evolved in concert with each other uh, that it inspired my favorite bumper sticker, which is that. Beavers taught salmon to jump. I think that, that gets at the connection nicely. So of course we know that, that historically, beavers were a much more prevalent force uh, on this continent than they are today. Um, you know, today we've got, you know, maybe 
10 to 15 million beavers in North America. Uh, you know, so they're not endangered by any means. They're, you know, they're all over the place. Um, but that's still a tiny fraction uh, of the beavers that, that lived on this continent historically. When European uh, colonists arrived, there were as many as 400 million beavers uh, in North America, building hundreds of millions of beaver dams and creating hundreds of millions of acres of, of ponds and wetlands. And a lot of what I try to do in this book is to go through old trappers journals, explorers diaries, railroad survey reports, Native American oral histories, just trying to figure out what a fully beavered continent would have looked like. And there are all kinds of amazing anecdotes uh, about how green and lush and wet and beautiful uh, all of these, these beaver compounds were. You know, you read about explorers crossing the state of, or crossing what is today the state of Indiana, you know, and not finding a, a dry place to camp for a hundred miles because beavers had so thoroughly just impounded the entire Midwest. Uh, here's a, a really nice quote, I think, from Meriwether, from Meriwether, Meriwether Lewis, uh, of, of course, of Lewis and Clark fame, um, who in the, uh, in the Missouri drainage in Montana uh, observed beaver dams succeeding each other on every single tributary of the Missouri, you know, as far as the eye could see up into the mountains. And, you know, you read observations like this in every, you know, in every core of discovery journal entry for weeks, uh, they're talking about how many, how many beavers and beaver structures they're seeing. And in some places they can't even use the valley bottoms because they're so thoroughly impounded by beavers. They have to travel along, along the ridge lines. Uh, so I think that's just you know, an amazing testament to what the continent looks like, uh, you know, with hundreds of millions of beavers. So that was in um, that was, you know, the early 1800s that Lewis and Clark saw all of those beavers. Uh, and then in, in 1843, uh, you know, just, uh, just 38 years later or so, uh, John James Audubon traveled the exact same route in Montana, looking for beavers to paint. Uh, and he couldn't find a single beaver in a vast watershed where Lewis and Clark had seen you know, thousands of them uh, just, a, just you know, four decades earlier. So what happened to beavers in that short time? Where did all of the beavers go? What did they get turned into? Uh, well, of course, they got turned into hats, right? Um, you know, I think a lot of people hear the phrase beaver hat, they think of like a big furry Davy Crockett type of thing. Uh, but in fact, beaver hats were sort of these elegant, you know, Victorian style top hats uh, that were all the rage in, in Europe. Uh, and the reason here, I actually have a, a beaver pelt here um, that I bought off a trapper. And you can sort of see um, the reason that beaver fur makes such good hats is that they've got two layers of fur. They've got these kind of long, outer guard hairs. Those are sort of the reddish hairs that you can maybe see here. And then underneath that, they've got a second layer of fur, uh, the under fur, which trappers call the beaver wool, which again, you can kind of kind of see down there. That's that, that dense, really soft stuff. Uh, and if you looked at those little under hairs under a microscope, you'd see that each one has a little hook or barb on the end. So they lock together like Velcro, uh, which makes this really durable, pliable, malleable, you know, waterproof hat material. Uh, so beavers just made you know, the, the best hats. Uh, so you know, the, the, the pursuit of these hats, the fanatical pursuit of these hats, really it's hard to overstate the effect that that had on you know, early American history. Uh, you know, really every sort of significant historical event prior to the Civil War had some kind of connection to this, this really rapacious beaver trade, uh, you know, the, the American Revolution, one of the uh, kind of the, the, the British offenses that angered the colonists was denying them access to trapping grounds west of the Appalachians. Uh, you know, the Louisiana Purchase, uh, you know, that was partly motivated by Jefferson's desire to secure new areas for trapping. Uh, you know, the, I mean, the, the, the War of 1812 has a strong beaver connection, uh, you know, and of course, it's, it's, it's also important to remember that it was those beaver trappers and traders uh, who spread smallpox and, and many of the other diseases that you know, so decimated many Native American tribes. Uh, here's, you know, I think a pretty powerful illustration of the, uh, the, the importance of beavers to early American economies. This is uh, a coin minted by the Oregon Territory in 1849, uh, and it was a beaver coin. So the value of one beaver coin was fixed to the value of one beaver pelt. So the entire currency was pegged to the, the beaver standard, essentially. That's how integral beavers were uh, in, in early economies. So of course, you know, in addition to being this hugely 
uh, important consequential historical event, you know, the fur trade was also uh, a really dramatic ecological event, right? The fur trade, you know, kind of begins in the early 1600s in New England and, you know, quickly spreads west to the Great Lakes uh, and south into the Carolinas. Uh, and, you know, by, by sort of the early 1800s, it's reached the Pacific coast in the Rocky Mountains. And, you know, by 1850 or so, uh, you basically can't find a beaver in the lower 48 states. So what happens when you trap out hundreds of millions of beavers? Well, hundreds of millions of beaver dams break down and hundreds of millions of beaver ponds drain. Uh, you know, so what does that, what does that mean for, you know, all kinds of, for cutthroat trout or moose or mergansers, you know, all of these animals that are really dependent on beaver for their habitat? Well, we don't really know, but there's no question that the, the loss of beavers was an ecological disaster uh, akin to the deforestation of New England or the busting of the, the sod in the Midwest uh, or the gold mining uh, that occurred in, in the Sierra Nevada. And there's really, there's no doubt that this is one of the kind of the great unsung environmental catastrophes uh, in, in global history. Uh, you know, this is the kind of scene that you see all over the American West. Uh, you know, this is a stream that's lost its beavers, right? And in, in a kind of a healthy, natural, beaver-rich stream, you know, you've got all of these beaver dams acting like speed bumps, slowing the water down and spreading it out onto the floodplain. But when you lose all of those beaver dams and all those beaver dams break down, there's nothing checking the velocity of water. And you get this really dramatic, rapid erosion. And you get these streams that are disconnected from, your, from their floodplains. All of the rich, you know, nice wet meadows and wetlands that, that should be up here, basically dry out and turn into just, you know, dusty pasture land. So you see streams like this all over the American West. And in many cases, they're the legacy uh, of beaver, beaver trapping. And, uh, you know, here's one of the, the kind of the, the casualties uh, of the fur trade is the, the boreal toad. Uh, you know, it's a, a kind of a, a toad that's endemic to the American West and, and much of its habitat is almost a, a beaver pond obligate. It, you know, breeds almost exclusively in beaver ponds. So, you know, what did it, what did it mean for the boreal toad that they lost 99% of their beaver created habitat? Certainly nothing, nothing good. So fortunately, by the early 1900s, you know, society starts to wise up a little bit to recognize that, uh, as the naturalist Enos Mills put it, you know, a live beaver is more valuable than uh, a dead one. And there were you know, kind of beaver reintroduction projects uh, occurring all over the country, you know, Washington, Oregon, California, Utah, uh, the state of New York had a big one that kind of repopulated beavers all over the, the Northeast. Uh, you know, a lot of these animals are coming from Canada, uh, where there, you know, there are still some beavers to find, or uh, Yellowstone National Park, um, where they were somewhat protected. Uh, so, you know, gradually beavers are, are sort of recolonizing their former haunts. And in many cases, there are laws put into place to restrict trapping uh, to allow them to uh, recover. Of course, the most famous uh, episode in, in beaver reintroduction uh, occurred in Idaho. Uh, in 1948. I'm going to try to show you some video here. There we go. Um, so this is uh, a beaver reintroduction project. Uh, they wanted to move some beavers into what is today the uh, Frank Church wilderness area. Uh, and first they tried moving them on horseback uh, into the backcountry. Of course, the horses didn't uh, take very kindly to that. Uh, so their next idea, you know, is 1948. It's just post-World War II. And they've got all of these kind of surplus uh, airplanes and parachutes on hand. And one of these Idaho fish and game biologists has the bright idea of actually airdropping uh, some beavers into the back country. So they designed these uh, specialized crates. Uh, they did a handful of, of trials uh, on a local airstrip. Uh, and then they started dropping beavers with parachutes attached. Uh, they dropped 76 beavers in 1948. 75 of the beavers survived, amazingly. One of the beavers unfortunately escaped from the crate in midair and fell to his death, very sad. Um, but the next year, when they flew back over this, this area, they found that beavers had established ponds and wetlands in all the places where they dropped them. So this was actually uh, a highly successful project in its, in its day and uh, was kind of state of the art. Nobody to my knowledge is air dropping beavers anymore, um, but at the time, that was apparently how you did it. And even California actually had its own, uh, its own, its own beaver airlift program. That was uh, somewhat, somewhat common in the mid mid 1900s. Oh, let's see. 
So, you know, throughout the 20th century, we've got beavers recovering, right, with, with human assistance. Beavers are coming back, they're recolonizing areas that they'd been trapped out of, in some cases, centuries earlier. Uh, but of course, the problem is that in the meantime, uh, humans have moved into all of those same areas, right? It turns out that good beaver habitat and good human habitat is basically one and the same. We both like these you know, fertile floodplains and low gradient streams. That's where we build our, our roads and our towns and our farms. Uh, and that's where beavers love to create these ponds and wetlands. Uh, so when those two forces clash, you know, conflict can ensue. I would argue that, uh, you know, it's us, not them, who are the real nuisance species. Uh, but there's no question they can be difficult to live with. Uh, here's a set of railroad tracks in Massachusetts uh, that were, they had just been refurbished for about a million dollars. Uh, and within three months of the completion of this million dollar railroad track reconstruction, beavers had them underwater. That's a kind of a classic beaver story. Uh, here, I like this picture. This is a, 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 a cabin that I visited in New Mexico uh, near Taos. Uh, and what you can see here uh, is that beavers, you know, their dam starts up here in kind of the top left corner of your screen. They build up to the base of the cabin then they incorporate the cabin in their dam and they continue on the other side. So that's, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be that landowner uh, with your, your cabin underwater, but you have to kind of admire the ingenuity there. Beavers just working with whatever environment they have. I think that's a pretty cool picture. Uh, another very common beaver conflict is damming and road culverts, probably the most common beaver conflict. Uh, you know, of course, for the for a beaver, you know, the road bed is this fantastic potential dam and the culvert the pipe is the leak in the dam and beavers hate leaks, right? That's their whole thing is plugging up leaks. Uh, so when this happens, you know, the water level rises and the road gets flooded or washed out, very expensive problem to maintain. So that's a, you know, classic beaver issue. Uh, but they do get occasionally more creative in the mischief they cause. Uh, here's the story of a beaver that broke into a, a dollar store in Maryland and was actually browsing the plastic Christmas tree aisle uh, when it was apprehended by the authorities. So there's all kinds of uh, odd stuff they, they do to, to mess with human infrastructure. So of course, the, the way that those sorts of beaver conflicts are almost always handled uh, is trapping out the offending beaver, right? That's, you know, it's, it's a very kind of intuitive approach. Uh, you know, the beaver's causing a problem, get the beaver out of there uh, by, by any means necessary, usually by, by lethal means. Uh, every year, you know, the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the federal, the federal government kills upwards of, of 20,000 beavers uh, for causing conflicts with, with human property. And, uh, you know, again, that's, that's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a somewhat intuitive approach, but there are a couple of big problems with our, our reflexive, knee-jerk, lethal strategy, uh, which is that first, of course, when you kill those beavers, you're also you know, potentially ruining this wonderful pond and wetland habitat that we know is so important for so many species. Uh, but the other thing is that you're just putting up a, a vacancy sign for the next family of beavers, right? As long as that road culvert is still there, attracting them to that site, they're always going to come back. So, you know, all over the country, um, you know, counties and towns are engaged in this very expensive, uh, inhumane cycle of trapping and recolonization and trapping and recolonization. So you start to wonder, you know, maybe there are better ways uh, of dealing with beaver conflicts that allow the beavers to remain in place. Uh, so, you know, here's, I think, a really nice example. Uh, you know, every year, many thousands of beavers are killed for cutting down trees. Um, you know, they cut down people's ornamental trees. They cut down, you know, people's fruit trees. Uh, and I just don't think that any beaver should ever be killed for cutting down a tree. That's just too easy a problem to solve uh, with a bit of, of wire fencing. Actually, I like—I really like this example because this is um, at a, a uh, kind of a land trust, a kind of a conservancy property in Colorado that I visited. And what you can see here is that this, the land trust that manages this property, you know, they they had these kind of these nice old cottonwoods they wanted to protect, so they they fenced off the cottonwoods um, against the beavers, and then they left unfenced the non-native Siberian elm trees. So the beavers targeted those invasive trees. That's that's invasive vegetation management using a beaver as a tool. I think that's a really cool uh, example of what, what can be achieved with a bit of you know, enlightened management. Uh, and then you know, the other really valuable tool at our, at our disposal 
uh, is what's known as a flow device or often a, a beaver deceiver. Um, this is Skip Lyle. He's you know, kind of the inventor of the beaver deceiver. Uh, and it's basically this pipe and fence system. Um, so you run the pipe through the beaver dam or through the road culvert. Uh, and then you've got, you know, sort of these, these fences or cages that you can see here to basically prevent the, the beavers from plugging up that, that pipe. And the idea is that you're essentially creating a leak, right? You're moving, you're moving water from the upstream side to the downstream side uh, and just dropping the height of that beaver pond to a level that ideally is acceptable to the resident beavers, uh, but, you know, is also acceptable to your, your, your concerns. Um, so, you know, you can say, hey, I really like having the beavers in my backyard. I appreciate all the cool stuff they do, but you know, I, I want to I want to get the water off of my off of my uh, my crops or my my lawn, uh, and you know, you can use one of these beaver deceivers basically to manage that conflict and essentially strike a compromise uh, between human and rodent. And there have been some great studies done on the, the efficacy of these things. You know, they're 85 to 95 percent effective. Uh, and they're really huge cost savers. When you think about all of the, you know, the time and expense of trapping, you put in one of these things for, you know, 1500 bucks uh, and the problem is basically addressed in, in, in most cases. So, you know, again, maybe not appropriate for every single situation, but there's no question that there are thousands and thousands of sites all over the country that we're currently managing lethally by trapping where we could be using non-lethal techniques uh, to solve that problem in a, in a, in a smarter way. Uh, another, another option for beaver management, um, which is, is very popular up here in Washington, but you know, not so common or really, you know, in most cases, not even really legal in California yet, um, is relocation, right? Is, is live trapping, quote unquote, nuisance beavers and moving them to places that could use some beavers. Uh, and you know, that's a very straightforward process. Um, you know, his is a, a beaver live trap, a, a, a Hancock trap. Um, you know, you basically catch, catch yourself some beavers. Uh, you know, they're, they're relatively straightforward animals to nab. And, uh, you know, ideally you're, you're sort of moving them uh, together as, as a, a family unit, um, relocating them into, you know, in most cases, public land, uh, you know, up in, up in the headwaters of a stream somewhere where they're gonna be far from human property. Uh, and can really do their thing in, in peace. This is uh, Sandy and Chomper being relocated in, in North Central Washington and the Metow Valley. And uh, in many cases, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the projects that do this, this beaver relocation, um, you know, they'll build them these kind of these artificial lodges. So they have some, some safety, a little house to move into, uh, which is, you know, kind of a nice, a nice way of getting them to stay put and not get eaten uh, by, a, by a cougar. And uh, here's a, a beaver enjoying his, uh, his, his or her new, new home uh, out, out here in Washington. And uh, in many cases, uh, now a lot of projects actually build these kind of artificial beaver dams called beaver dam analogs. And, uh, you know, similarly, the idea there is that you're, you know, creating this nice deep pool uh, to help them feel safe. And, you know, you're giving them a bit of, a bit of structure to build off of, you know, so they're not just moving into this, you know, completely destitute environment. They've got a, they've got kind of a, a Kickstarter dam uh, that they can, they can work on until they get fully established. And, uh, you know, this is a very low cost, low, low effort technique uh, to you know, improve beaver habitat. Uh, obviously the only danger is uh, broken fingers. You gotta watch out for that, that sledgehammer. So, you know, I've been talking about all of these different um, strategies for beaver management, uh, you know, using these, these beaver deceivers, uh, fences, relocating them. Well, what's the point of all that? You know, what do, why, why do we want beavers on our landscape? What do they do? You know, and I, I know that I already talked about their importance for, for fish and wildlife habitat, but what do they do for us humans uh, that, you know, that, we, we, that might make us want them around? Uh, what, what services do they provide? And of course, that's not the, you know, the full measure of a species, um, but you know, it is a helpful argument uh, to be able to make. What do beavers do uh, that's, that's valuable? Well, there are all kinds of sort of wonderful ecological services that, that beavers provide. Uh, you know, the biggest and most important one out here in the American West, of course, is that they, they store water really well, right? They create these fabulous reservoirs. 
Uh, here's a, you know, a really, what I think is really a wonderful case study in Northeast Nevada and in Elko County. Um, here's, this is Maggie Creek, uh, a tributary of the Humboldt River. Uh, and, you know, what you can see here is, is that this, this creek has been ruined by, or had been ruined um, by, a, you know, almost a century of unmanaged cattle grazing, right? They were just, you know, cows all over this, this valley bottom, uh, devouring the vegetation, basically destabilizing the banks. And, you know, you get this very kind of eroded, barren, lifeless channel. And, you know, again, you see this all over the American West, right? I mean, so many streams have been sort of very heavily impacted um, by, by unmanaged cattle grazing. So in, in this case, the Bureau of Land Management and, you know, these local ranchers, you know, basically, they basically put some kind of common sense uh, grazing prescriptions in, in place. They put up some fences to keep the cattle out of the stream. They changed the grazing rotations a little bit so the cattle weren't, you know, hanging out in the stream bottoms for as long. Uh, basically some very common sense things. Uh, and, you know, thanks to those prescriptions, uh, the vegetation started to recover. There were some, you know, some cattails started growing back, some willow, other plants. And, you know, and, and nobody was really thinking about beavers. Beavers were not the point of the project, uh, but they just have this kind of miraculous way of showing up uh, wherever there's food and, and water. Uh, so in the early 2000s, beavers returned to this area and began to build, build dams. So this picture that you can see, this is, this is Maggie Creek in 1980. The next picture I'm going to show you is the exact same stream and almost the exact same place uh, in 2017 when I visited after about 20 years or so of, of beaver recovery. So just keep this picture in mind and then check out this. That's really cool, right? That looks pretty good. Um, you know, you might look at this, at this stream and say, well, wait a second, what are beavers doing here? I don't actually see any beavers. Well, all of this cattail growth is actually growth atop a, an old beaver dam. Uh, so they're really deeply embedded in this system. So of course you can look at this and say, well, clearly this is a, you know, a, a better, ecosystem than this one, um, but because there were scientists involved, they also wanted to quantify some of those, some of those changes. Uh, and what they found were that beavers added 20 acres of open water. So they're building dams, you know, creating these, these lovely ponds. So there's more open water around. That's, you know, great news for Lahontan cutthroat trout and all kinds of waterfowl and, and so on. Uh, they actually added three miles of wetted stream length to Maggie Creek. So what does that mean? Well, this stream was so degraded that it was actually going dry before reaching its confluence with the main stem river, right? So by, by building those dams and slowing the water down, they're making sure that there's still water in the stream come August, September, the, the hot, dry seasons. So they basically took this seasonal stream and by slowing the water down, made it a perennial one. I think that's a, a really, amazing thing that beavers do. And you hear that story a lot in places where beavers have, have returned. Uh, another fabulous thing they did was they added two feet to the water table. So when you look at a beaver pond, you know, there's all of this visible surface water you can see. But what you don't see is the, the weight of that pond forcing water into the ground, you know, raising the water table, hydrating the soil, recharging aquifers, uh, and basically sub-irrigating these, these vast valleys. There's all kinds of groundwater storage happening in beaver complexes that you can't, you can't see. Uh, so as a result of that, that groundwater storage, that, that sub-irrigation that beavers were doing, uh, they, they saw a 100 acre increase in the riparian or the stream side vegetation, right? So beavers basically took this dry barren valley and made it lush again. I think that's really amazing. Uh, and that's a big deal for this guy. This is uh, James Rogers. He's uh, a rancher uh, who, you know, who has his cattle uh, out there in Elko County. And, you know, and the point that he made to me was that beavers were basically increasing the production of, of grass forage, of forage for his cattle, tenfold by irrigating uh, these, these valleys. So, of course, that means, you know, more, more weight on his cows and more money in his back pocket. So now, you know, in Northeast Nevada, uh, there's this really wonderful kind of very progressive uh, cluster of, of pro beaver ranchers because they've experienced these, these fantastic benefits. Another fabulous thing that beavers do is they're really good at capturing pollution, right? And improving water quality. So what you see here, this is a, a nice picture, I think. Here's the, here's the beaver dam. You know, this, is, this dam is probably at least 15 or 20 years old. It's a you know, pretty old dam. Uh, and as, you know, as water 
reaches that, that pond complex created by that dam, you know, the water slows down and all of the suspended solids that the water is carrying have an opportunity to drop out of the, the water column, right? All of that nitrogen, phosphorus, heavy metals uh, are basically, they're just settling out and being, being captured uh, in this nice little beaver created settling basin. And here, you know, you can just see this, this wonderful accumulation uh, of sediment over the course of many, many years. And of course, there's lots of carbon storage happening there too, right? I mean, there's, there's you know, all of this organic matter uh, that's being being captured uh, by these these beaver ponds. And you know, when you when you kind of do the back of the envelope math, I mean, you see that the the carbon sequestration benefits uh, of of a beaver complex are equivalent or even greater than the carbon sequestration of that the same area of forest. Uh, so beavers are you know they're really storing quite a lot of 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 pollutants, uh, as well as quite a lot of carbon. Uh, and here's just one, one nice study that was conducted in, in, uh, in England, actually, in the UK, uh, where they found that a single pair of beavers, just two beavers, uh, you know, captured 100 tons of sediment, uh, 15 tons of carbon, and a ton of nitrogen. So that's just two beavers, uh, you know, providing all of those, those sort of carbon and, and pollution uh, sequestration benefits. Another fabulous thing that beavers do is they, they slow down floods, right? You know, we talked about beavers and their role in kind of fighting drought by creating these reservoirs and turning seasonal streams perennial. Well, in addition to fighting drought, they're tackling the exact opposite problem, flooding. I think that's really amazing. Uh, you know, of course, they're doing that by, again, building these, these pond complexes, building these dams so that, you know, when a big pulse of, of, uh, of stormwater comes rushing down a stream, you know, instead of just hurtling down that channel, it's spreading out, it's sinking into the ground, uh, it's being captured in the pond. Uh, you know, they're just, they're just slowing, spreading, storing, and, and sinking all of that, that stormwater. Uh, so, this is a, a picture that I took in, in Scotland, uh, where beavers were recently reintroduced. And, uh, you know, there, of course, it's a, very, it's a very rainy place with a lot of destructive flooding, and, and there beavers are being reintroduced primarily for their, their flood control benefits. So I just think that's an amazing thing that, you know, you've got this, the, kind of the two opposite problems on the hydrograph, the flooding on one end, the drought on the other end, and beavers are helping us address both of them. And then the, you know, the final beaver benefit that I wanted to talk about tonight that of, of course is just so relevant to you in California uh, and to us in Eastern Washington as well is their, their firefighting ability. Uh, of course, you know, water doesn't burn. And by, by creating these wonderful impoundments, you know, they're creating fire refugia, you know, these, these areas that wildlife can retreat to during, wild, during wildfire and, and be relatively safe. In some cases, they're creating fire breaks they're actually stopping the, the movement of, of wildfire across the landscape altogether. And you know, here's just a, a wonderful illustration of, of the fire refugium concept. Uh, this is in Idaho. Uh, this is the Sharps fire, which burned about 100,000 acres a couple of years ago. And you can just see you know, all of these, these hill slopes have just been burnt to a crisp. And uh, the only green, wet, blue, lush place remaining on the landscape uh, is is that that beaver complex? I just feel like this this picture basically says it all about about these animals. So, given all of these wonderful beaver benefits, why aren't they more beloved than they are? You know, why do why do we still kill so many tens of thousands of them every year? What's our what's our problem with beavers? You know, and to me, I think it's I think it really comes down to the the concept of ecological amnesia. Uh, you know, when we trapped out hundreds of millions of beavers. We destroyed the landscapes they created and we, we internalized a very different concept of what a, a healthy aquatic system should look like. You know, I think when most people think about a stream now, they think about this fast moving, free flowing, you know, gravel bottomed, single threaded channel, just, you know, shooting through the landscape. And they don't think about these slow, kind of stagnant, marshy areas with, you know, dead and dying trees all over the place. Uh, but, you know, as we've seen, these kinds of wetland habitats that beavers create are, are you know, in many ways more healthy uh, and in many places certainly more natural. They were the, the historic status quo prior to European arrival. 
So, you know, I think that in some ways to fully embrace beavers and bring them back, uh, you know, we have to reconfigure our ecological imaginations, you know, to internalize this kind of landscape uh, as really a, a vital and healthy one. So to sum it all up, you know, we have this wonderful animal uh, that provides us and other species all of these incredible ecological benefits. Uh, it does it for free and uh, it doesn't even need permits. That's the, that's the best part. So uh, to sum it all up, you know, as, as the, the mantra of the beaver believer goes, it's time that we stepped back and let the rodent do the work. That's the, the call of the beaver believer. So with that, I'll, I'll say uh, thank you so much. I think we have some, a little bit of time for, um, for questions. Um, you know, there's my, there's my email address if you're interested in, in, uh, in purchasing a signed copy of the book. Uh, please feel free to send me an email. Um, or if you have a, you know, another a beaver question that we don't get to tonight, um, you know, I'm, I always welcome hearing uh, from, from beaver aficionados. And uh, yeah, with that, I think we can just open it to, uh, to questions. Okay, thank you so much, Ben. We have an audience full of eager beavers who want to ask you some questions. So I'm going to share some of the questions from our Zoom chat and Facebook live comments. So if folks want to keep pouring those questions in, feel free. Um, and as a reminder, this lecture series is possible thanks to the sponsorship of Papa and Barkley and our other conservation programs would not be help would not uh, yeah, we just couldn't do it without your help. So we'll paste the link to donate and for um, purchasing the book also in our um, chat. All right, so we've got many questions over here. Um, uh, Sherman asks, how many babies, how many kits are in a beaver cohort? Yeah, typical litter is two to four. Great. Um, and Carol wonders, are there any beaver lodges in hu the Humboldt area that we can go see? And um, I can elaborate on that too, Ben. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, Ru Ruth, I know, I know you did some digging, so I think, I think you should take that one. Okay. Um, we did look, uh, we were asking around about this because I personally have only seen evidence of beavers on the Mad River. Um, but I also asked around at Humboldt State University, which is our, our local university in the wildlife department and asked Michaela Gunther about this. And she's had many students um, undergraduate and graduate alike that are doing various research projects and they too in Humboldt County are mostly seeing beavers, at least evidence of beavers along the Mad River. Um, but she didn't know of any lodges or dams that were in the county, but she had a student studying beaver lodges in this, on the Smith River, which is north of us in Delmore County, and they found that the lodges were more prevalent up there, but none were very large and most of them were actually under kind of under the water surface yeah you know there's there's there it might maybe it's maybe it's the same the same the same student but i remember seeing a, a really wonderful uh graduate thesis basically about the the sort of salmonid refugia benefits of even the beaver lodges right so in many cases you know beaver so you know in a, in a big river like the smith you know the beavers aren't they're not building dams because there's already sufficient water depth. So they're living very happily in these these bank lodges. Uh, you know they're just built into the riverbank um, with no no dam required. And you know and those lodges have these these kind of underwater tunnel entrances. And it turns out that those those underwater tunnels are really good places uh, for juvenile salmon to to hang out in and and uh, take it easy and and get big. So I think that's that's a that, that was just a really amazing piece of research. I think because it showed that you know beavers don't have to build dams uh, to create really good fish habitat. They can do it just by building their lodges in the in the riverbank. Absolutely. Um, Sharon Clay from Turtle Bay Exploration Park in Reading, she works with beavers. She says, you talk about the reason they build dams so that they don't have to be on land as much. I thought one of the main reasons for dams was to make the water deep enough to prevent the water from freezing so that they can enter their lodges and store branches in the water during the winter. Is that not accurate? Well, I mean, yeah, you know, I, th I think that that is, you know, that's, that's part of the story, but, you know, but you do see beavers 
building, um, you know, these are creating these nice deep ponds, even in even in areas, you know, like the like the Southwest uh, that, you know, that don't freeze up um, during during the winter. So certainly um, she's absolutely right that it is important that beavers, you know, in, in places that do freeze, it's really important that they that 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 pond remains at least partly liquid all, all winter long because you know beavers don't they don't hibernate right they they do in the fall they assemble these food caches at the bottom of the pond and basically spend the winter going from lodge to food cache they're active all winter so absolutely true that they don't want that pond to freeze to the bottom um, that's a, a, certainly another another reason to create that depth. Um, we have. A question about mosquitoes. So I think this was in reference to you talking about the rethinking how we imagine our landscape and having more of this um, slow moving water. Um, so there, Sherman's concerned. What about mosquitoes? Yeah, good, good question. So, so there's there's only one study about beavers and mosquitoes, and it actually found much many fewer mosquitoes in beaver complexes. Uh, and the hypothesis there being that you know they're creating because they're creating really good habitat for you know fish, amphibians, birds, uh, all of these mosquito predators. Uh, you know they're actually enhancing the habitat of the the animals that eat mosquitoes. Um, so you know there hasn't been a ton of research on that the beaver mosquito connection, um, but you know the 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 one study that does exist found in favor of the beavers. Excellent. Um, Bryn wants to know what the legal hurdle is to relocating beavers in California. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question, and you know, and certainly there there are, are people who um, know much more about that than I do. Um, you know, there are a couple of really great um, nonprofits working on on beaver issues in California. Um, there's Worth a Dam. Uh, which is which is based in Martinez, uh, which is you know probably the most famous beaver colony, certainly in, in California, probably in the world. Um, so you know Heidi Perryman runs that, uh, and then there's the the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, uh, which is a Bring Back the Beaver campaign. Um, so I, I can you know I can send you links to those those folks, and they, so they, they have a much better handle um, on the the kind of the the, the beaver policy issues. Um, there, my yeah, I, I could be wrong. My understanding is that, is that it's basically only legal right now to sort of move beavers to tribal land um, in in California. Um, you know, assuming that the, the tribes want them, uh, and and nowhere else. Um, and that certainly needs to change. You know, I think that's one of the, you know one of the kind of the ironic things is that when you think about uh, you know a state that desperately needs more beavers. Uh, you know, it's California, right? A state that's, you know, that's withdrawing its, its, uh, its groundwater supplies, uh, is obviously, um, you know, racked by wildfire issues, uh, has, you know, sort of declining uh, salmonid populations. Um, you know, California desperately needs more beavers, um, but it actually has, you know, a lot of backwards beaver policies, unfortunately. And the, the, that's really the legacy of beavers being classified as a, a non-native species in much of, much of California um, for a century. Uh, and the reason for that really is, is so, you know, if you tolerate a little bit of history, you know, California, as many of you probably know, had two fur trades, right? It had, it had the overland fur trade, you know, guys like Kit Carson crossing, uh, crossing the Sierra Nevada, but it also had the maritime fur trade. Right, you know the, the, the British, the the, the Spanish, um, Russians, uh, all taking sea otter and beaver pelts um, uh, by sea. Uh, so what we really what happened was that you know the maritime fur trade came first, and by the time the the, the overland fur trappers arrived, you know most of the beavers were gone uh, from places like Southern California, the Bay Area, you know a lot of the Northern California rivers. Uh, so the consequence of that was you know they didn't see any beavers, they just assumed that the beavers you know, weren't there and had never been there. Uh, and that actually got sort of internalized as, as sort of sound biological history by Joseph Grinnell, the, you know, the great, the great uh, ecologist and, and naturalist um, who basically said, okay, beavers are just, you know, not a native species in much of California. Um, so, you know, more recently, uh, a group of, of researchers assembled a really wonderful trove of evidence showing that beavers, in fact, are native throughout the state of California. You know, there's no reason they wouldn't be. Um, and, you know, and basically proved that case. 
But you know, I think that the legacy of beavers being considered non-native uh, really casts a, a, a long shadow. So, you know, the Cal when you look at sort of the, the some of the policies that we have in in Washington, um, you know, we're we're a much more progressive beaver state, I think, than California is uh, in a, in a number of different ways. And um, you know, I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that they were considered a non-native species for a long time. Yeah. Do you mind if I? comment on that also? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, you know, in California, we have a, a law in place that makes it illegal to relocate any animals, um, any native animals. And generally, that's a really, a, a law based on really sound science that most animals don't really survive a relocation because you're either separating them from their, from their babies that you've left behind. Um, so you have orphaned animals that could be left behind if you trap and take mom somewhere, or you're moving them to a spot that now they don't have any you know, ecological knowledge of, so they can't really thrive there, and they're competing with others of that species that do. Um, so generally, it's really, we think of it as like a humane solution, but it's typically not a hum humane solution to a wildlife problem and a wildlife conflict. But for beavers, when we're doing these relocation efforts, it's it's really different when you're working with animals that, sorry, we're, we might hear my dog barking, <laughs> um, with animals that don't have competitors but are native to that area. And that area has been assessed to be suitable and have the appropriate components for them. So when you were talking about beavers, you're saying, oh, look, they're taking this family pair together to this location that they have assessed out as appropriate for beavers. So it really is kind of complex. <laughs> yeah, saying. certainly, you know, and, and I mean, and you're absolutely right that, you know, I mean, there, there are studies, I mean, different places where beavers were relocated mm -hmm. and, you know, every single beaver family was instantly eaten by a cougar. So it's right. like, okay, obviously, you know, that's, that's not, that's not a, a, hu a humane approach. Um, but, you know, some, some of these, some of these, these uh, beaver projects, you know, do get, you know, 50% establishment or so is, you know, is, yeah. is a, a pretty good success rate. Um, and, you know, and those are animals that, you know, and those would have, would have otherwise been, been lethally removed. Um, so, you know, I, I certainly, I certainly agree that it's, you know, it's not, uh, it's not, it's not foolproof, but, you know, in many cases, it, it, I think it beats the alternative. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Sherman. Do natives traditionally eat beavers? That's a, a really good question, and uh, you know, and, and the answer is is it, it you know depends on the tribe, um, and that's you know I think that one of the really interesting things uh, about sort of beaver history is the the way that different native tribes interacted with and, and understood beavers. So you know what's interesting is that when you think about the kind of the history of the fur trade, you know, in in the American Northeast. Um, you know, when the when the, the first European traders arrived, you know, native people were were very willing and eager uh, to trade pelts with them. Uh, and you know, and the reason, I mean, partly the reason was economic, but partly the reason was they, they you know they they said, hey, you know, trapping beavers when you when you remove beavers from an area, you know, what what happens is that pond drains and you get this nice kind of lush meadow uh, that's really good habitat for, you know, for deer and moose and, and animals that we hunt. Um, so, you know, in part, beaver removal and, and, you know, native management there was about enhancing wildlife habitat. As now, as the fur trade moves westward across the continent and, you know, and gets into Montana, uh, you know, all of a sudden tribes like the Blackfeet are totally unwilling uh, to, to sell beaver pelts to, to white people. And the reason for that um, is that, you know, in, a, in an, an arid place like central Montana, uh, you know, the tribes, tribes like the Blackfeet understood that beavers create these really vital watering holes, essentially, you know, that, that are, are just fantastic uh, spots for, you know, for, for bison and other, other game species. So the Blackfeet actually sanctify the beaver, uh, you know, and, and the beaver is sort of one of the, the one of their, their highest deities, essentially. So they have cultural prohibitions against killing beavers, which is the reason that, uh, you know, trappers like Kit Carson and Jim Bridger and Hugh Glass had to become trappers because, you know, because native people wouldn't do their, their dirty work for them in the Rocky Mountains um, because they had those cultural prohibitions against killing beavers. So yeah, the answer just totally depends on the, on the tribe. Um, it is. 802. Ben, we have a couple more questions if you have time. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, <about> beavers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, 
Our zoo director Gretchen has a question. She says, there was a news piece on NPR a while back that I only partially heard from a scientist who posits that beavers are contributing to climate change. I think it had to do with flooding and accelerating the melt of Arctic permafrost. Could have that detail wrong though. What in your opinion, um, do you, are you familiar with this or do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. So, so what, what, what that's referring to is, is there, there have been some studies recently basically showing that beavers are moving north, higher up into the Arctic, uh, you know, as, as tundra is being colonized by willow, um, beavers are, are following. And, you know, and they do create these, these big ponds that, uh, you know, that may melt the permafrost under, underneath. Um, so I would say a couple of things about that. I mean, well, first, look, obviously, you know, beaver's contribution to permafrost melt is minuscule compared to our contribution to permafrost melt. That's one thing. Um, you know, a second thing is that, you know, we don't really know if beavers were in that area historically. You know, maybe it is, maybe they are really colonizing areas that they've never lived before, or maybe they're colonizing areas that they were, that they did occur and were trapped out uh, 150 years ago. We don't, we don't really know whether that's, that's a colonization event or a recolonization event. Um, and then, you know, the third thing that I would say, and, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a shameless beaver apologist, right? So I take this with a grain of salt. Um, but, you know, look, we know that, that as, as the climate warms, you know, all kinds of creatures are, are gonna have to shift north, right? We know that, you know, that moose are moving north higher up in the Arctic. We know that wolves are moving north. You know, salmon are turning up in Arctic rivers. They've never been present before, uh, at least not in, you know, in sort of recent memory. So, you know, all of these animals are going to have to shift their ranges to survive. And, you know, here we've got beavers, uh, you know, the animal that creates fantastic habitat for salmon and, uh, and moose and is a wonderful food source for wolves. Uh, you know, I think that in some ways, you know, beavers are, are are kind of paving the way um, for these northward migrations that we know are, are going to have to happen. I remember a couple of years ago, the New York Times had a headline that was like, you know, agents of Arctic destruction or something like that in, in regards to beavers. And, you know, I would say they're really uh, agents of Arctic adaptation in some ways. You know, they're making it possible for, for uh, other species to, to colonize these areas where they're going to have to live. Um. Courtney says, I saw a video of a researcher who would encourage beavers to build dams where humans wanted instead of flooding out roads by playing a recording of running water in the desired location. Have you heard of that? And is it still a viable conflict management technique? Yeah, I, I've, I've heard of that. I would say that, that um, that's not very commonly used. I mean, it is true that beavers, you know, are partly responding to kind of like the auditory uh, cue of, of, of trickling water. Um, you know, now, now mostly when, when sort of co beaver conflict managers want to direct beaver activity and behavior, they'll, they'll build one of those beaver dam analogs that kind of human built beaver dam. Uh, and that basically gives them you know, again, kind of a starter kit. So they can say, okay, you know, like we, we want them away from the culvert. We'll, you know, we'll build them a little starter dam over there and they'll go, they'll go work over there. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's, that's generally considered more effective than the, the, the running water technique. Yeah. We have, someone asked if your book is available at a local bookstore in Eureka. And I did not check on that before the lecture, but I do know that Eureka Books will order your book. So feel free to call and support our local businesses during the pandemic. They would greatly appreciate that. Um, uh, Brian asks, can Ben clarify the comment he made about no permits needed? What was, I don't, I don't I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure I recall, recall that comment. Oh, no, oh, at, the, at the end, just, yeah, just, you know, just that, um, Look, if you, you know, if you wanted to do a stream restoration project, uh, you know, using a, a you know, a, a backhoe and an excavator, um, that would require a lot of Army Corps paperwork, uh, whereas beavers can modify streams in a very positive way uh, without, without having to file much of anything. Of course, you know, relocation would require some, some paperwork, but, you know, just that these are, you know, these are animals that transcend the, the federal bureaucracy uh, in some, some good ways. Absolutely. Well, I think that's our last question. We had so many fantastic questions, a lot of folks tuning in tonight. And 
yeah, we just, we need more beavers. What can we say? That's our takeaway tonight. <laughs> um, thanks again for joining us and sharing your knowledge with us, Ben. We'll make sure to share these links um, on the video on our for our Facebook video that is saved. So if you want to go back later and check that, we'll have those available. Um, and as a reminder, our next lecture will be Wednesday, February 17th at 7 p.m. We'll be hearing from Christina Ward, whose talk is entitled Saving the Endangered Giant River Otter, a community-based approach to conservation. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight, and we will see you next time. <laughs>